Perfect. All right. Okay. I think we're ready to start. Thanks for hanging in there. So I haven't spoken to you guys about congestive heart failure, which is my favorite topic to talk about um, since 2014, right when I started at AERC. So what's neat is, is there's been a, a few changes in how we manage and treat congestive heart failure and, and diagnose it since that time. Um, so six years later, here we go again. <laughs> Okay, so I think the most important thing to talk about with um, treating heart disease is we can't treat it if we don't know that it's there. And so the first third of my talk is gonna be devoted into um, how to recognize and diagnose that severe cardiac disease exists in our cats and our dogs. And so in general, dogs are much easier, in my opinion. Um, so to review, the most common acquired heart diseases in the dog are chronic degenerative valve disease and dilated cardiomyopathy. Those two on this list are 99% of the things that I see as a, as a cardiologist when we're talking about acquired canine heart disease. Uh, I also put on the list hemangiosarcoma, myocarditis, and infective or valvular endocarditis, just as a little reminder to you all that there are a few other diseases that dogs get as they age, um, but the top two are definitely the most common. So history, a, a good thorough cardiac history is so important into tipping you off if there's primary respiratory disease or primary cardiac disease. So the owner might talk to you about coughing. Um, that's a very common clinical sign in dogs with cardiac disease. So it could be a new cough where the, the dog has never coughed in the past, but over the last week, the coughing has started and now it's increasing in frequency. Or it could be a worsening or a change in a previous cough. So maybe there's a, a chihuahua who's had a collapsing trachea her whole life and, and she's had a goose honk cough but now there's a soft, moist, productive cough um, at rest and, and maybe in the morning. So there could be a change in the cough. Respiratory abnormalities are very common. Um, so this would be tachypnea, dyspnea, and especially restless sleeping at night. They can't get comfortable. Um, they have to, to sleep sternally in order to breathe well, and they just turning and tossing all night long. Exercise intolerance is another important one. Um, along with syncope, which is a kind of an obvious cardiac um, clinical sign that the, the owner might pick up on, but they might interpret it as a seizure. So we have to kind of tease that out a little bit. Uh, followed by inappetence, weight loss, or nothing. You know, the dog may be clinically fine at home and you just, you pick up on a murmur, which we'll talk about on your exam. So physical exam, um, doing a thorough cardiovascular physical exam, what can you look for in these dogs? Well, dyspnea would be the big one. Um, so labored breathing, followed by pale mucous membranes. So if they're hypoxic, the mucous membranes might be pale. If they're really hypoxemic, the mucous membranes might be cyanotic. The CRT will be prolonged if there's poor cardiac output. And in dogs, I really wanna emphasize that we see tachycardias in dogs that are going into congestive heart failure. So bradycardia would be very unusual in a dog with congestive heart failure, um, unless there was a primary arrhythmia going on, like third degree AV block. So um, the vast majority are going to be tachycardic. And dogs are also really helpful because they have heart murmurs, and they're pretty easy to hear. Um, so in a dog with degenerative valve disease, you're going to hear a loud systolic heart murmur in a dog in congestive heart failure. The one exception to dogs with heart disease having heart murmurs, um, I wanna point out that some dogs with dilated cardiomyopathy might not have heart murmurs, even though they do have functional mitral regurgitation on their echo. So with dilated cardiomyopathy, the, the left ventricular chamber dilates, that distorts the mitral valve apparatus. Um, and then we see a little bit of, or even a moderate amount sometimes of mitral regurgitation but the systolic function of the left ventricle is poor. So when it contracts, the mitral regurgitation goes backwards into the left atrium at a reduced velocity. And that lower velocity is something that might prevent our ears from picking up on a heart murmur. So some dogs with DCM have murmurs, but some of the really advanced dogs might not have a heart murmur. So going down our list, um, arrhythmias are also found on physical exam, along with spontaneous coughing. And here we have a picture of a, of a poor boxer who is quite dyspneic, 
Um, I would actually call this orthopnic. So this dog is extending her neck out to breathe to maximize her airspace. We might feel weak femoral pulses, which I call hypokinetic, inspiratory crackles on auscultation um, and or expiratory wheezes, a distended abdomen due to ascites, so you might pull out an abdominal fluid wave and to see the uh, concurrent jugular pulsation all the way up the neck. So it's normal to see jugular pulses on the ventral one third, but if they go all the way up the neck, that would be a sign of right atrial or right ventricular volume overload. A low or normal rectal temperature is consistent with advanced cardiac disease. So if you're in congestive heart failure and you have to pick as a body where you're going to put your very limited cardiac output, you're gonna shift it to your most important vascular beds. So your brain, your kidneys, your coronary arteries, you're not gonna send your blood flow to your rectum. So a lot of dogs will have a low rectal temperature. A fever would not be consistent with congestive heart failure. Um, as well, there'll be low or normal blood pressure as a response of poor cardiac output and low or normal pulse oximetry. On radiographs, we, uh, cardiology is a, is a specialty. We came out with the vertebral heart scoring system, I think back in 2004, and it was, it was created by Dr. Jim Buchanan, who unfortunately we recently lost um, to, to health reasons, but he was a pioneer of our, of our specialty. And he stated that a vertebral heart score of the dog should be greater, I'm sorry, it should be less than 10.7. Um, so normal would be 8.7 to 10.7. And so anything greater than 10.7 on a thoracic radiograph on a right lateral view is indicative of cardiomegaly. Now that, since that came out 16 years ago, we have found that there are some breeds that are exceptions to the rule. Uh, for example, boxers, cavaliers, a lot of brachycephalic breeds tend to run a little bit higher than this. So you can certainly still do vertebral heart scoring systems, but just make sure that there's not a breed exception. And if there is, look at that reference range. Right now, I think there's over 20 breeds that fall outside of this 10.7 cutoff. We will also see interstitial or alveolar patterns in the lungs. And I know everyone, when we do a talk, we kind of in our head, we come up with five important take home things that we want the audience to, to take away from the presentation. And this would definitely be one of mine. So if you remember nothing else from this talk today, and that's fine, because I, I understand, um, I do want you to remember that dogs in congestive heart failure tend to put their cardiogenic pulmonary edema caudodorsally. So cranioventral, we think of pneumonia in dogs, but caudodorsally is where congestive heart failure likes to go. When we're looking at the VD on dogs, sometimes the, the caudal distribution of the pulmonary edema is, is asymmetrical. It, it sure is nice when it's symmetrical, and that's, that's very consistent with what we're taught in vet school, is that both caudal lung lobes will be equally affected. But in real life, sometimes it's asymmetrical, but it is caudal dorsal. We might also see enlarged pulmonary arteries and veins, which is very much supportive of the diagnosis of congestive heart failure or cardiac disease, um, but they don't have to be distended. It's just very helpful when they are. So how to recognize disease in cats? Cats are much harder. Um, cats are so difficult. And, and I have um, some colleagues that just are, you know, they've dedicated their, their careers to doing cats. And, and they will tell me, you know, gosh, sometimes I feel like giving up because I, I feel like I'm doing everything I can. And some of these cats are still slipping through the cracks and I'm not diagnosing them. So I agree, they're really, really hard. In review, the most common acquired feline heart diseases are not valvular issues. Um, we're talking about cardiomyopathies. So by far and away, number one, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and, and that's the vast majority. And then, you know, occasionally, you know, several times per year, I'll find a few cats with restrictive, dilated, or unclassified cardiomyopathies. And then we have the thyrotoxic cardiomyopathy, which is not really a primary or an idiopathic cardiomyopathy. That's secondary to hyperthyroidism. I guess I could also add to this list uh, hypertensive cardiomyopathy, which is, as you guessed, a secondary to hypertension. So in a cat, what will the owner tell you? Well, they'll say a lot of the same things as dogs. So there could be respiratory abnormalities, inappetence, um, weight loss, unkempt fur, 
the cat might be focusing its energy on breathing so it doesn't take the time or the effort to groom. And then more unique to cats here, I have on the list, sudden paralysis of one or more limbs. So cats are much more predisposed to thromboembolic disease when they have heart disease. It's not that dogs can't have thromboembolisms, but when they do, it's usually not the heart's fault. It's usually due to something like the loss of antithrombin-3 um, from a protein-losing nephropathy. It's not usually the heart's fault in the dog. But in the cat, 8% of cats with severe heart disease will have arterial thromboembolism at some point. Or nothing. The cat may be fine at home. So notice I didn't mention coughing on this slide. Um, so in my residency, which, um, which I started 14 years ago, my mentor you know, didn't usually like to talk in black and white, but he did with, with this. He said, Michelle, cats in congestive heart failure do not cough. And I thought, great, that's, that's wonderful. Um, so if they're coughing, it must be asthma. Um, he did say they could cough from heartworm disease, but that's, that's different than congestive heart failure. So I went into my career, you know, so excited that, that cats that are coughing are not in congestive heart failure. And I could use that to differentiate them from cats with respiratory disease. Um, and, and I will say after doing this for 16 years, um, I have had about five cats that I am positive that they were coughing when they were in congestive heart failure. And when their pulmonary edema went away and we treated them, they stopped coughing. So it happened in five cats. Um, it, it, it is possible, but it's super, super rare. So typically, if you see a coughing cat, it's not congestive heart failure. On physical exam, what will you see, feel, and hear? Dyspnea, pale mucous membranes, just like the dog, prolonged CRT. The difference in the cat here is they can be tachycardic or bradycardic when they're in congestive heart failure. So that's not helpful. Um, they can do either one. I found that if they have a, a steroid-associated um, congestive heart failure episode, where they were given prednisone or dexamethasone, they're more likely to be bradycardic in that instance. And if it's an idiopathic cardiomyopathy, a little bit more likely to be tachycardic, but they're cats, they can, they can do whatever they want. Arrhythmias are super helpful in cats. It's, it's very rare for a cat without heart disease to have premature beats. So an arrhythmia will be a helpful finding for you. A gallop sound is super helpful that tells us there's really severe diastolic dysfunction and the left ventricle is stiff as it's filling with blood. You might notice there's cold, rigid, or painful limbs with no pulse. That's a sign of thromboembolic disease. And you may or may not hear a heart murmur. A heart murmur is not as helpful in the cat, and we'll get to that. So why are cats so challenging diagnostically? I came up with a lot of reasons. First, if we took a room of cats and every cat in this room had really severe heart disease that was confirmed with echocardiography, only one third of these cats would actually have heart murmurs. The other two thirds would, would sound normal. Now, if we had a different room of 100 cats, let's say, and all of these cats in the second room have heart murmurs, only one third to one half would actually have heart disease, depending on which retrospective study you look at. So cats can be really tricky. Um, the other half to two thirds of cats in the second room would have benign heart murmurs. Um, so for example, a dynamic right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. We see that commonly. And that's a murmur that's due to just being excited, having increased sympathetic tone in the clinic, um, the heart's contracting hard, and they get a benign murmur. So third, cats typically don't cough, as we just talked about, when they have heart disease. Most of our cats aren't going on three mile runs, right? So the owners can't tell us, gosh, you know, they used to run three miles just fine. And now at about a mile and a half, my cat's really winded. So that's not gonna be helpful. Um, they don't exercise enough to show us that something is changing. They don't show clinical signs until very late in the course of their disease. They're a master at hiding their disease. So in the wild, they wouldn't get picked off. Their murmurs come and go. I have so much fun with vet students when they come in and shadow on the cardiology service. Um, they'll proudly come in and say, you know, Dr. Rose, I heard a murmur on a cat. I finally heard one. It was really loud. It must have been a grade four. And then uh, the cat's been here 15 minutes and has, has had a chance to calm down um, while the student's presenting the case to me. So I'll come in the room and I'll be like, nope, 
no heart murmur here. And they're like, ah, oh, you know, they get so mad. And they're like, I swear to God, it was there. And after I let them freak out for about a minute, then I tell them, I believe you, you know, I'm sure it was there. Um, we can have a cat with a grade four murmur one minute and the very next minute it can be completely gone. So their murmurs can be very dynamic. Lastly, um, what, a second to last, cats can have severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and can have completely normal radiographs. So if we remember with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we have our, our V-shaped left ventricle and the hypertrophy is going to thicken inwardly into the heart chamber. So the outside of the heart isn't dilating and the thoracic radiographs are just showing us the outside of the heart, the cardiac silhouette. So they can have severe HCM and look fine on radiographs, assuming they're asymptomatic, I should put that in there. If they're in congestive heart failure, then radiographs are gonna be helpful. So just like in life, cats do what they want. So they're hard, but we love them very much. So radiographs are the most helpful when the cat is actually in congestive heart failure. So in this case, we're gonna look for the cardiac silhouette in the cat to be greater than 8.1 we're gonna find a patchy interstitial or alveolar pattern in the lungs. So different from the dogs, um, and I will say cats, again, can do whatever they want, but they tend to put their, pul their pulmonary edema ventrally. So if we are looking at a lateral view of a cat, we would see an interstitial pattern in the cranial ventral lungs in front of the heart and the caudal ventral lungs behind the heart. They may have enlarged pulmonary veins and arteries as well. So we're gonna switch gears. We talked about history, physical exam, and thoracic findings, thoracic radiograph findings for the dog and cat. And now I wanna spend a little bit of time on NT Pro BNP. So NT Pro BNP, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is a cardiac biomarker. It's specific to the heart. There's no other organ in the body that can release it. And it is released in proportion to the severity of the heart disease. So the more severe the heart disease, the theory goes, the higher the NT pro BNP is. So that's pretty cool. It stands for B-type natriuretic peptide, and it's produced in both the ventricular and the atrial myocytes. Anything that causes stretch or stress of these myocytes will lead to release of the pro form of the hormone, pro BNP, into the bloodstream. And so anything like valve disease, DCM, HCM, pulmonic stenosis, all of these heart conditions are things that can lead to stress or stretch on the myocardium. So once the pro BNP is released into the blood, it's then cleaved into an N-terminal fragment, which is what we're actually measuring with this test, and a C-terminal fragment. The C-terminal fragment is the one that's the biologically active hormone. Um, the NT pro BNP is actually not biologically active, but it has a much longer half-life than the C BNP, and that's why we measure it with our test. It's, it's, it's easier to pick up in the blood, longer half-life, um, and it's more accurate. So what BMP as a hormone does is it causes vasodilation of the arteries, and that leads to reduced afterload or reduced resistance against cardiac output, which is a good thing, natriuresis, and diuresis. So we're losing sodium and water through the kidneys into the, into the urine, and that helps with volume overload. So these are beneficial effects for an animal with heart disease. And BNP is one of the hormones that helps the dog or cat stay cardiac compensated. So there's three indications for, for everyone in private practice for performing an NT pro BNP at this time. And this is a super helpful tool for you guys to have, especially if you don't have an echocardiogram right next to you. You know, so unless you work with a cardiologist or are really good friends with one, um, it, it's sometimes impossible to get an echocardiogram right away, especially in these times with all these wait lists that everyone throughout the Twin Cities are experiencing. Um, and obviously some owners don't even want to be referred to get an echocardiogram. So this is a wonderful test that you can have either in lieu of an echo if you just can't get one right away or might help you say to your owner, okay, now we really have a good reason to get an echo and it's used as a justification for further diagnostics. So indication number one, NT pro BNP is helpful at differentiating an animal who is symptomatic and saying, okay, you're symptomatic, you're dyspneic, 
you may be coughing, do you have heart disease or do you have respiratory disease? It's not a standalone test though. So you want to use this after taking thoracic radiographs to help give you some more information. So my second really important take home point from this lecture is that a low, or in other words, a normal NT pro BNP is very, very helpful for ruling out congestive heart failure. So if you have a symptomatic animal and the BNP is normal, it is not congestive heart failure. The negative predictive value of this test is very, very high. So we're gonna look at first dogs. And again, these are symptomatic dogs in this scenario. If the NT pro BNP is less than 900, you can pretty much rule out congestive heart failure. If it's greater than 1800, that tells you that there's increased stress and stretch on the myocardium and congestive heart failure is pretty darn likely. You should be treating for heart failure at this point. If it's in this gray zone of 900 to 1800, then we do recommend using further diagnostics if possible, like an echo. If that's not possible, you can certainly do a furosemide trial and just be very open in your mind to it either working or not working, but you can certainly do a trial. Um, and you can always use all your other diagnostics, such as your thoracic radiographs, your exam, to help you figure it out for these gray zone cases. For symptomatic cats with respiratory signs, if the NT pro BNP is less than 270, it's not consistent with severe heart disease. If it's greater than 270, then congestive heart failure is likely. Okay, so indication number two, detecting occult cardiomyopathy in Dobermans and cats at risk. So these are now asymptomatic patients that we're talking about. So I wanna start off by saying that for sure, the, the gold standard and the only way to diagnose a Doberman with dilated cardiomyopathy is via echocardio echocardiography and Holter monitoring. So some Doberman pinchers will manifest with the electrical abnormalities of DCM first. So they get VPCs and ventricular tachycardia. Um, unfortunately, sometimes sudden death is their first clinical sign. And later their echo might catch up and start showing systolic dysfunction. So we need both of those tests for Doberman pinchers. But an NT pro BNP is a good screening test. And why do I keep talking about Dobermans? Um, by far and away, they're the most um, predisposed breed to getting DCM. So their genetic incidence is extremely high and they are very much at risk as they age. So with cats, there are several breeds of cats that are predisposed to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, to name a few, Maine Coons, Norwegian Forest Cats, British Short Hairs, Ragdolls, um, and Sphinx would probably be the top five. And so we can also use the BNP test as a screening test in these at-risk cats. If also, if we hear a cat with a heart murmur, a gallop, or an arrhythmia in a clinic, that is now a cat who's at higher risk for having cardiac disease, and the NT pro BNP would be a good test for that cat, whether or not it's purebred. I mean, if you're hearing a heart murmur, um, it's a good test to do in a cat like that. We just don't want to do an NT pro BNP test for every single animal that we see as an indiscriminate screening test, because that's when we start to see a lot of false positives. And that's the same with any, any blood test. You know, if you're screening a population with a low incidence, then the likelihood of getting a false positive is much higher. But if you're selecting this test for a Doberman or a, a cat that might be like a Maine Coon or a cat with a heart murmur, then the incidence of a false positive becomes much lower. So if you see an elevated concentration of BNP here, that justifies pursuing an echocardiogram. So at the bottom, we talk about, um, this is from the IDEX website. It says for Doberman pinchers with an NT pro BNP greater than 735, they're at, re at increased risk for occult dilated cardiomyopathy. So zero to 900 is considered the normal range for a, another breed of dog. But in Dobermans, we're discovering that lower than that, lower than 900 is actually significant and they should be worked up for DCM. There's been several studies now by cardiologists in the United States, um, one of them by my mentor, Dr. Sonia Gordon at Texas A&M, and she found that 550 actually was a better cutoff for a Doberman. So 550 or higher, we recommend a Holter and an Echo for that Doberman. 
So in asymptomatic cats, so again, cats that are not showing dyspnea, an NT pro BNP less than 100 would be considered normal. Anything over 100 would be considered abnormal and justification for recommending an echo. I have a lot of my vets uh, email and they say, Michelle, it was 104. I wanna do a dental and an anesthesia and it's 104, what should I do? Um, that's, that's an abnormal result. So there probably is some stress or stretch on that cat's myocardium, um, but it's probably pretty mild at 104. It's probably not a giant left atrium. Um, so the anesthetic risk might be a little bit elevated, but hopefully not huge. Indication number three, we can use NT pro BNP to predict morbidity and mortality in dogs with heart disease. So dogs with preclinical degenerative valve disease, so this is asymptomatic dogs, that have radiographic or echocardiographic heart enlargement. So in other words, dogs with valve disease that are stage B2, right? So they have a murmur, um, they have enlargement of the heart, but they're asymptomatic. If their NT pro BNP is greater than 1500 P moles per liter, they are likely at an increased risk for the development of congestive heart failure. They're actually six times higher of a risk to develop congestive heart failure in the next three to six months than a dog whose BNP is less than 1500. So these are dogs that we need to watch very carefully and probably treat with pemobendin to try to slow the, pr the progression down and, and just teach the owners what to monitor for as far as signs of dyspnea and, and elevated respiratory rates. So I'm finally gonna uh, talk about for the NT pro BNP section of this talk, I'm gonna mention the, the SNAP test that is available to cats at this time. It's not available, available with dogs. It's a cage side test that's available in, in ready in 10 minutes. And it's gonna tell you normal or abnormal. So it's not a quantitative test, it's a qualitative test. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we go over a case example. So for all of the types of NT pro BNP tests, not just the SNAP test, um, occasionally we will see false positives. And this is most common in animals with chronic kidney disease, hyperthyroidism, systemic hypertension, because hyperthyroidism and systemic hypertension can affect the left ventricle and, and cause hypertrophy, um, sepsis, anemia, and cirrhosis. So NT pro BNP is mostly eliminated through the kidney. So anything that's gonna slow down GFR is going to decrease the elimination of this hormone into the urine and it's gonna falsely elevate it. False negatives are pretty uncommon, um, but when seen, they're often associated with obesity and the mechanism of action for that is still being elucidated in both human and veterinary medicine, but we think it has something to do with obesity increasing the GFR. And so it's increasing the excretion of NT pro BNP. And in cardiac tamponade, there's, there's severe heart disease present there. I mean, the animal's dying unless we do something about it. But with tamponade, we've got the pericardial effusion compressing the heart. So the, myo the myocytes are not stressed or stretched they're compressed. So that can lead to a false negative. So in summary, there's some key differences between dogs and cats with recognizing heart disease. Dogs usually have murmurs, cats may not. Dogs cough, cats typically do not. Dogs will show their clinical signs sooner. Cats are the species that are predisposed to thromboembolic disease. And radiographs are much more sensitive with dogs. In addition, we want to use the NT pro BNP to help differentiate between cardiac and non cardiac disease in clinical patients. So, once we've identified the patient is likely in heart failure based on our history and physical exam, radiographs, and plus or minus a BNP test, now it's finally time to treat. So, the baseline lab work in an ideal situation that you would want to have before giving your first dose of diuretic would be a BUN and a creatinine to look at kidney function because our diuretics are gonna affect our kidneys, electrolytes, and ideally a urine specific gravity. So this is your last chance to test the concentrating ability of the kidneys before you start giving diuretics. And now the kidneys can't concentrate urine. If an animal is really, really dyspneic and stressed out, especially a cat, it is certainly okay to make the clinical decision to say, you know what, this is too dangerous, I'm gonna skip it. I'm not gonna put this cat on its back and take um, a cystocentesis. 
So use your clinical judgment. If you are able to get this lab work, that's great, but if you can't, certainly understandable. So the emergency drugs we're gonna talk about uh, for this talk, because this is only a one hour talk, um, is furosemide and pemobendin. Um, if you guys are interested in dobutamine and nitroprusside, we can certainly email about that. And then later, once the patient is stable, we do ACE inhibitors. I do prefer benazapril. Um, I feel like there's a little bit less side effects with benazapril compared to enalapril, and it's a little bit less renally eliminated in the, in the kidney than enalapril is, although it is still majorly eliminated by the kidney, just a little bit less so than enalapril. We'll talk about Plavix, which is clopidogrel in cats as an initial platelet antagonist. And finally, spironolactone, which is a mild diuretic, but more used for its aldosterone inhibitory effects. So let's talk about furosemide or Lasix. So in an emergency setting, um, so we have a really dysnic animal here, I give a bolus that's um, initially large to a dog or a cat, and then I back off. So for dogs in active congestive heart failure, I either give two, four, or six mg per kg of furosemide IV or IM. You can give it sub-Q, but it's, it's not gonna work nearly as quickly, so IV or IM would be preferential. So two mg per kg for the dog that's wagging its tail at me, four mg per kg for a pretty dysmic dog, and to the dog that's coughing up pulmonary edema and is orthopnic, then I will pull out that big gun six mg per kg dose. After that first dose, then I'm giving two mg per kg afterwards. Now cats are much more sensitive to the effects of furosemide. Um, they're much more likely to have a significant renal azotemia and to become dangerously hypotensive, which will further worsen kidney disease. Um, so I divide all of my cat doses in half compared to the dog doses. So for that same cat, I'm either gonna give one, two, or three mg per kg as my initial bolus, and then I'm giving one mg per kg afterwards. So I usually repeat these doses every one to two hours, you know, the two mg per kg or the one mg per kg, every one to two hours until the respiratory rate decreases by about 20%. So if my dog comes in at 100 breaths per minute and I'm giving that two mg per kg every hour, when it goes down to 80 breaths per minute, now I can start to back off a little bit. So then once we've got that reduction in the respiratory rate, I give two mg per kg to dogs and one mg per kg to cats every four hours. And if they're getting better, then we decrease to every six hours. And then finally to every eight hours. Once they're on every eight hours, we can transition to oral Lasix and send them home on that. And we'll talk about the oral dose in a second. By now, I think we're all familiar with Pemobendin or Vetmedin. This was approved by the FDA for use in dogs with congestive heart failure back in 2008. As you guys know, it's an inodilator, which is a, a fancy word that means it's a positive inotrope and it's a balanced vasodilator. So it's gonna help increase contractility in the ventricles and it's gonna arteriodilate, which reduces afterload or resistance. And it's gonna venodilate, which increases the capacitance of the veins and they can store more blood and that reduces preload returning to the heart. So it helps with volume overload. Pimobindin is also a calcium sensitizer. That's one of the ways that it's also a positive inotrope because it's gonna increase the chance of calcium binding to troponin C. A lot of people don't know that Pimobindin is also a positive lucitrope. So that means that it aids with ventricular relaxation during diastole. So it's actually gonna help the heart fill with blood for animals who have diastolic heart diseases, such as degenerative valve disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and restrictive cardiomyopathy. Pibobendin does lead to better perfusion to the skeletal muscles, and that results in a better activity level. And that's important because owners, you know, perception is reality. So if they see that their animal feels better and is more active, they're gonna be much more likely to continue treatment. So the dose of Pibobendin is 0.5 to 0.6 mg per kg per day and we split that into two doses. They can be equal doses, that's probably ideal, but they don't have to be equal doses if it doesn't work out weight-wise with the animal. We do the same dose for dogs and cats. We know that pemobendin is indicated, 
So there's no, there's no debate. Um, there's been a lot of good prospective placebo controlled double blind studies in dogs. Um, it's indicated for dogs with congestive heart failure due to degenerative valve disease or DCM. And that is the majority of our dogs with acquired heart disease. So in an emergency setting, even if you don't have an echo, if you have an older dog in congestive heart failure, it is okay to give them pemobendin. In the emergency setting, it works within two hours. So yes, it's oral. Um, if they're incredibly dyspneic, you might have to wait a little bit, but if you, can, if you can get it in the dog, it will work within two hours. In cats, we have less information, but there have been some retrospective studies performed. And we know that pemobendin increases survival time in cats with heart failure due to both hypertrophic and dilated cardiomyopathy. We do need more studies, um, especially prospective studies. Cats with systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, um, this is a phenomenon seen in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where the mitral valve inappropriately flips up into the left ventricular outflow tract during systole and it causes an obstruction to blood flow. Happens in about 50% of cats with HCM. We say these cats have HOCM for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. There is a little bit of a concern. Um, there's been a few cats with HOCM that were given pemobendin and they developed a really severe systemic hypotension and then a corresponding severe tachycardia um, when they were administered pemobendin. There's been a lot of cats with HOCM who have been given pemobendin safely, but just because of the few cats that had this really severe reaction, um, it does lend us to be a little bit cautious with what cat we pick the drug for. And there's definitely a lot of owner education involved. So we don't indiscriminately use pemobendin for congestive heart failure in cats for that reason. Other treatments for congestive heart failure would be butorphanol. So this is an opioid that is not going to decrease the respiratory drive in the medulla. Um, so it's a safe cardio, a cardio safe, I guess is a good word, drug used to sedate a very anxious animal who can't breathe effectively and is starting to stress out. So I like to use 0.2 mg per keg, either IV or IM, every eight hours. Same dose for dogs and cats. Now, obviously in the emergency setting, we're using oxygen and we wanna treat effusions that are present. So thoracocentesis, abdominocentesis, and pericardiocentesis. Okay, so now that we've talked about the emergency treatment of congestive heart failure, um, I think it'd be more helpful now to talk about clinical management of these patients. So you're sending them home. What do you recheck? When do you recheck it? What do you do if there's a relapse? So we're gonna talk about all these right now. So we're gonna look at our 10-year-old female spay dachshund called Heidi, and she's super cute, and she's super happy to be in your clinic despite what's going on in her life. Her owner tells you that she's developed a cough over the last week that's been progressing, and she's tachypnic. On your physical, on your physical exam, she's BAR, she jumps up and licks you in the nose. She weighs 6.5 kilograms, and she has a sinus tachycardia with a heart rate of 164. So it's not a crazy tachycardia, but it is fast. Her rest, I'm sorry, her, re her respiratory rate is 60 breaths per minute. So it's elevated, but not scarily high. And you escult a grade four out of six left apical holosystolic murmur. Heidi has increased bronchovesicular sounds bilaterally on her lung auscultation. You don't hear any crackles, but just kind of harsh lung sounds and her temperature is low normal at 100.4. She is stable enough for all of the diagnostics listed here. Her CBC, CAM, and UA come back normal. Blood pressure is about 130, so within that normal range. And then here are her thoracic radiographs. So we have a right lateral view. Let's see if I can get my pointer, yep, okay. So there is dorsal deviation of the trachea, which is indicating some type of ventricular enlargement. In her case, it's gonna be left ventricular. Her caudal waist of her cardiac silhouette is lost and it's, it's quite enlarged. Um, so this is all left atrial enlargement. Her pulmonary artery and vein look pretty normal. Um, I, I definitely don't think they're bigger than the fourth rib where they cross it. Um, they look like they're the same size relative to each other. So the pulmonary vessels are normal. Looks like there's a little bit of a pleural fissure line here. So maybe just some scant pleural effusion. 
And the most noticeable thing is this caudal dorsal severe unstructured interstitial pattern. Um, looks like it might even be a little bit alveolar right here because we've got an air bronchogram. So we've got this caudal dorsal pattern. And then left lateral, pretty much the same thing. She's eating well, good for Heidi. And then on her VD, we can see that there's quite a large bulge at the two to three o'clock position. And this is indicative of left auricular enlargement. There's left atrial body enlargement too. I'm sure you guys can see the, the little double bubble or the increased spherical opacity right here. And then lung wise, there is a interstitial coalescing to alveolar pattern, um, probably a little bit worse on the left side than the right. You can see these little tiny air bronchograms over her diaphragm here, here. So alveolar down here, interstitial over here, a little bit worse on the left. So time for poll question number one. Um, just one second, I'm gonna pull this question up. Okay, perfect. Okay, hopefully that works. Um, so poll question number one, I'm gonna have you guys choose the answer that you agree with most. Now that we have looked at Heidi's thoracic radiographs, which statement do you agree with most? One, Heidi's enlarged cardiac silhouette and pulmonary pattern are consistent with cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Let's treat her for congestive heart failure. Two, I'm confused. Heidi's lower pulmonary vessels are normal in size, so this, makes, this finding makes congestive heart failure less likely. And then number three, I am uncomfortable starting treatment for congestive heart failure without an echo or at least some other kind of testing, like an NT pro BNP. So I'll give you guys a, a few more seconds and you can let me know what you think. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. This is, this is cool, this is exactly <laughs> what I thought the distribution was gonna be. Okay, so I'm gonna share the results, right, Heidi? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, this is totally what I thought you guys were gonna do, perfect. Um, so most of you say that we should treat for congestive heart failure, um, and, and that's how I feel. I would be very comfortable at this point. Um, number two, her pulmonary vessels are normal in size. They are, they're normal. Um, so when pulmonary vessels are distended, it is super helpful at supporting the diagnosis of congestive heart failure. But we don't have to have them be distended in order to say, yes, this is congestive heart failure. Um, we're taught in radiology, I was taught to that they have to be big, but they don't. So I would say out of all of my congestive heart failure patients that I take radiographs on, I'd say 20% have normal vessels on the RADs. Like when I'm echoing them, their pulmonary veins are absolutely huge, but not always the most um, sensitive finding on radiographs. So sometimes they can look normal. So don't let that dissuade you. And then the last group, this is completely fair too, um, I'm uncomfortable starting treatment without some other test. So in Heidi's case, she's not actively dying in front of you. So if you wanna wait and send out an NT pro BNP, usually comes back in 24 hours, you know, you can certainly do that. Um, if you want to send her home on a furosemide trial and then wait for the results and, and tell the owner, you know, if it comes back less than 900, we're gonna stop the furosemide, that's certainly fine too. In her case, we, we do have an NT pro BNP available. Um, we sent it out after these RADs and it came back at 2,500. So that would lead everyone to feel pretty comfortable, I think, about treating her for congestive heart failure. Okay, and then how do I get rid of this? Just click this here. Okay, perfect, all right. So her diagnosis is suspected congestive heart failure. We don't know the cause because she hasn't had an echo. I would suspect it's degenerative valve disease just based on her breed, but we don't know for sure. So her outpatient treatment. So furosemide, I recommend a dose of two mg per kg for the dogs, um, assuming there's no underlying renal compromise. So in dogs, I like to do that two mg per kg dose three times a day for three days to help get rid of all that pulmonary edema. 
And then if my owner reports back that they're doing well, their respiratory rate's decreasing, the coughing is decreasing, then after that three-day period, we can back down to two mgs per kg twice a day for long-term use. So with Heidi weighing 6.5 kilograms, we chose the 12.5 milligram tablet of furosemide, and we're doing one tablet three times a day, and then one tablet twice a day. And that comes pretty close to our target dose. She came up with a 1.92 mgs per kg. For pemobendin, reminder, the dose is 0.25 to 0.3 mgs per kg twice a day. So for her, if we gave one and a half tablets of the 1.25 milligram Betmedin, that's 1.875 mgs or 1.88 mgs. Um, we did that twice a day and that came up to 0.29 mgs per kg. So that's a nice dose for her. And then the third drug, the ACE inhibitor, I always, always say, are they eating? So her radiographs and her owner both said, yes, Heidi's still eating. So if they are, then we can go ahead and start Benazapril. The number one side effect of both Benazapril and, and, and Enalapril is GI stuff. So hyporexia, anorexia, vomiting, diarrhea, nausea, I mean, they, they really can get GI side effects. It happens about 25% of the time. So I don't like to start it unless the animal is already in a good place where they're eating and they're not having diarrhea. So the dose I recommend is 0.25 to 0.5 mgs per kg once a day. You can do it twice a day. Um, to be honest with you, we as cardiologists, we have looked at ACE inhibitors, studied them so much for almost 30 years. And they, they just, I mean, they're okay. <laughs> they don't make a huge difference in survival time. Um, they sometimes don't make any difference in survival time. They're supposed to be really helpful because they prevent the, the kidneys from retaining sodium and water and they, they lower resistance. But despite all of their theoretical benefits, when you actually test it out in a trial, they don't make a huge world of difference. So if the dog can tolerate them, yeah, great, I give it once a day. If they can't tolerate them due to side effects, then I am quick to give up and I rely on pemobendin. It just seems to be a much more effective drug. So discharge instructions. We talked to the owners about monitoring the resting or the sleeping respiratory rate daily. It is best to do it when they're sleeping, but if you can't catch them in a sleeping moment, just when they're really calm, it is fine. The owner should be monitoring the appetite. One of the most important things are for these dogs to eat. So if they stop eating and they're taking diuretics, they're gonna become very dehydrated very fast. So they need to eat. Speaking of eating, we do recommend a reduced sodium diet, um, but if they won't take it, if they're really picky, again, the most important thing is that they actually eat. And I say no exercise for the first week. Just you have pulmonary edema, we're trying to get rid of it, take it easy. If they're doing well after the first week, then I think it's okay for them to have slow leash walks, things that won't elevate their heart rate too much. But I discourage activities like hunting, sprinting, fetching, tug of war, running up and down with the zoomies, up and down the stairs again and again. Um, all those things are gonna elevate the heart rate and, and cause myocardial oxygen deprivation. And unfortunately for these guys, once they're you know in heart failure, the the whole train for elective anesthesia has, has left the building. So no more elective anesthesia. If there's a severe problem, then we can talk about gritting our teeth and doing a very high risk anesthesia, but elective procedures should not be pursued anymore. And I recommend rechecking these guys in one week. So what you're gonna look for is the blood pressure. Um, hopefully the pulmonary edema is going away on the thoracic radiographs or, or gone would be even better. And you're gonna to wanna to reassess a chemistry profile to look at the kidney function and the electrolytes. So if you guys haven't been to this website, I love it. And I really wanna give it a shout out here. So the nutrition service at Tufts University is really, really on top of the cardiac research and, and finding heart-friendly diets and low sodium diets. And so there's a whole wealth of information on this website here. And what I wanna point out in particular is they, they do us the huge favor of creating these lists um, and they update them once to twice yearly of reduced sodium food for dogs and reduced sodium foods for cats. And so they list it in order of the most sodium to the least, but all of these diets are, are low sodium. 
they're targeting less than 100 milligrams of sodium per 100 kilocalories. And I wanna point out that if you see a diet on this list that's listed as low sodium, you can't pick a different flavor. You have to, you have to look at the flavor that's listed. Um, different flavors within the same brand might be very, very different. And unfortunately too, the, the companies are changing their, their recipes all the time. So a list from four years ago might not be accurate anymore. So definitely try to get the most up-to-date list. And there is a list for cats too. I just didn't post it here. There's also a section of really helpful reduced sodium treats and ways that you can administer medications to the dogs and cats without adding salt to their diet. So going back to Heidi, she comes in for her recheck one week later and her coughing is 90% resolved. So the owner's feeling pretty good about things. The owner is doing a good job of taking her resting respiratory rate daily and reports that it has dropped from 60, which was what it was at her presentation to your clinic. And now it's 20 to 24. So anything less than 30, I'm very happy with. So we're, we're, we're happy with this number. Her blood pressure is just the tiny bit low at 110 millimeters of mercury systolic via Doppler. And I'm okay with that. Um, it's, you know, it might be a little low because she's on an ACE inhibitor. As long as it's above 85, I'm, I'm pretty happy. Her thoracic radiographs were improved so that interstitial and alveolar infiltrate have resolved. And I wanted to point out her chemistry profile because this is a very typical case that you guys will see. So her BUN prior to therapy was normal at 26. Now that she's on furosemide, enalapril, and pemobindin, it has increased to 40. So there's a mild elevation. Her creatinine went from normal to high normal. So it's 1.1 to 1.6. And her SDMA went from normal at 12 to now it's slightly elevated at 15. So this is a mild azotemia. Um, it is a clinically acceptable azotemia for a heart failure patient. So I, I would call this permissible. This is okay. Um, if anything, it does tell me that her owner is being compliant and that she's giving the medications that we recommended. Um, if you see no change, you would, you would wonder about the owner's compliance. So I'm okay with these values. If the BUN was something like 80 and her creatinine was 2.5, then we would try to taper her furosemide to a slightly lower dose to see if that would help improve the kidneys. But I'm okay with these values. So then at the end of this recheck, um, you would probably recommend prescribing spironolactone if there was no significant azotemia and if Heidi was doing well. So if she's active, if she's eating, if she feels good, then she's a candidate for getting a fourth drug. But you know, she just started these three medications a week ago. Her owner is trying to get used to the new schedule of giving them. So what I usually say is let's send them home with spironolactone but we don't have the results of the blood work yet. Let's, let's at least give it a few more weeks before we consider starting a fourth medication. And the dose I recommend is one mg per kg twice a day or two mg per kg once a day. So for Heidi, we're gonna give her half of a 25 mg tablet once a day, because that's close to two mg per kg. It's 1.92 mg per kg. And the theory behind prescribing spironolactone is that it, it antagonizes aldosterone. Aldosterone causes the kidneys to retain sodium and retain water. So it's gonna increase preload. It also causes myocardial fibrosis. And we don't want scar tissue formation in the heart because scar tissue isn't going to relax and it's not going to contract. So anything to prevent that would be ideal. So we prescribe spironolactone for that reason. It is a, a very mild, mild, mild diuretic. Um, you can't use it by itself to treat heart failure, but you certainly can use it with furosemide. And so since spironolactone is once a day, um, I'm gonna have them give that in the morning because if there is a diuretic effect in her, she can go potty during the day. And then we can give the benazepril, which is also once a day at night. Tell the owners to recheck a chemistry profile again after they start the spironolactone. So if they start the spironolactone in two to three weeks, then they'll be checking the, the kidney profile about a month after the original, original diagnosis, and, and that's the optimal time. Further follow-up can happen about every three to four months. So as long as she's doing well, I recommend having them come in every three to four months for RADS and blood work to look for any emerging pulmonary edema. Try to catch a problem before it develops into a full-scale crisis. Um, 
if the dog obviously is starting to have an increased resting respiratory rate, then come in much, much sooner for radiographs. So what about future relapses? So my typical to-go home dose of furosemide, as we talked about, is two mg per keg for the dog, and, and they maintain on twice a day long term. So with each congestive heart failure relapse, and the first one usually comes on average in about three to four months after the first heart failure episode, with each relapse, then we increase the furosemide. And before torsamide was available, and I'll talk about torsamide in a second, because it's a really cool new loop diuretic, um, we would just kind of go higher and higher with the furosemide. So we start off at two mix per keg twice a day. Oh, we had a relapse. We'd go up to three mix per keg twice a day. Then at the next relapse, we'd go up to three mix per keg three times a day. Then we would add a thiazide diuretic called hydrochlorothiazide, and the dose is listed here, one mg per keg. And then at that point, if the owner was still with us, because a lot of times now people are not wanting to, to keep going because the quality of life is starting to decline. But if we had another final relapse, we would do the ceiling dose of furosemide, which is four mg per keg three times a day. If you give more furosemide than that, there's not going to be any clinical effect, no additional diuresis. So I have a little blue line drawn here because now after this three mg per keg dose, twice a day of furosemide, that's where I do start to change things around with torsamide, and, and we'll get to that. So torsamide is a loop diuretic, just like furosemide, and in the same manner, it also causes the excretion of sodium, potassium, chloride, and water. Loop diuretics are the most important aspect for treatment of congestive heart failure in pets and humans. So torsamide compared to furosemide has a higher bioavailability, a longer half-life, and a longer duration of action. We've been using it in veterinary medicine for about seven years now. It has had some studies performed um, in dogs, and the test study in 2017 showed that it was non-inferior to furosemide. Furosemide is our gold standard, right? So anything we use in lieu of furosemide, we want to make sure it's just as good and just as efficacious. So torsamide was non-inferior um, back in 2017 when given to dogs with degenerative valve disease that were in heart failure, so stage C. I want to point out that in this study, it was used as a rescue diuretic. So when furosemide was starting to fail and we're starting to see some diuretic resistance, then torsamide was used to replace furosemide. And that's how I've always used this medication. I've always used it as a rescue diuretic. A few weeks ago, a um, brand new study, hot off the press, um, was published in JVIM, and it's called the CARPO-DM study. You have to love the acronyms that they come up with for these studies. Um, it, the, the actual name of the study doesn't work out to anything like a C and then an A and then an R, but they use different, different combinations of some of the letters and some of the words to come up with CARPO-DM. Pretty cute. So this study showed that torsamide was non-inferior to furosemide when used as a first-line congestive heart failure therapy. So it's the first time we've had any information regarding that. Um, so dogs coughing, take radiographs, it's heart failure, whoop, put them on torsamide. So they compared that to furosemide and found that the dogs had the same survivabil survivability big word, um, and there was even some potential benefits of torsamide over furosemide. Um, they were less likely to, to unenroll from the study due to dyspnea and coughing. So it seems like it was a pretty effective medication when used as a primary diuretic right from the start. So in dogs, torsamide's duration of action is 12 hours, so it's about double furosemide, which is six hours. I don't know if any of you know this, but Lasix gets its name because it lasts six hours. So um, it's, it's double the duration of effect of Lasix. Torsamide is dosed at about one-tenth to one-thirteenth of the furosemide dose. So it's much more potent. So when I use torsamide, again, I've only used it as a rescue diuretic. Um, this is typically what I do. So the dog's on two mg per keg of furosemide twice a day. They have a relapse. We bump up to three mg per keg twice a day of furosemide. And then at that second relapse, once I need to have three mg per keg three times a day, 
at that point I say, okay, you're getting resistant to furosemide. These are pretty high doses. And then I switch to the equivalent dose of torsemide. So if Heidi, who weighs 6.5 kgs, if I give her three mix per kg, three times a day, she would require 58 milligrams of furosemide to stay compensated. So I take that 58 milligrams and I divide by 10. And so her total daily dose is 5.8 milligrams per day. Torsemide comes in five and 10 milligram tablets. So that works out pretty well. So I have been giving torsemide twice a day. So I split that into half of a five mg tablet twice a day. And then further relapses from there, you could always bump up to three quarters of a tablet twice a day. Um, next one, bump up to one tablet twice a day. You can even go up to three times a day. So you kind of treat torsemide in the same manner as furosemide with bumping it up with the relapses. So hopefully that helps clarify a little bit on how we treat congestive heart failure in the dog, um, how we look for relapses, and what we do when we see those relapses. So now we're gonna talk about clinical management of a feline patient who's a cutie patootie named Ralph. He's six years old, male neutered, DSH. And his history is that he has a chronic mild cough. So there has been some long-term history of a very mild cough that he has not needed to ever be medicated for. And he has a sudden onset of respiratory distress. He's not currently on any medications and weighs 5.1 kilograms. He's more quiet than Heidi the dog was. So he's quiet and alert on his physical exam, has a sinus tachycardia of 222 beats per minute, and he does have some regular, I'm sorry, some rare extra systoles. So that's a little, a little tip off there. He's having some premature beats. His respiratory rate is markedly elevated at 100 breaths per minute. On auscultation, no murmur, no gallop. So not too helpful there. There are inspiratory crackles and he's hypothermic at 99.8. The veterinarian on this case did not think he was stable enough for a CBC chem or UA, but his blood pressure came back at about 110 and his chest rads follow. So I'm going to show the radiology comments. So, you know, no one is smarter than a boarded radiologist when looking at radiographs. And even they struggle sometimes, and I struggle sometimes. And I'm sharing this case because it's very, um, it's, it's a good real life case to, to share with you because this will happen to you as well. So on right lateral, the pulmonary vasculature, and this is a direct quote, the pulmonary vasculature is diffusely prominent, but not overtly distended. So what does that mean? Like, is it, is it big? Is it small? I think they're trying to say it's normal, but it, it's, um, it's worded in an interesting way. So I would agree it, it looks normal on, on this radiograph here. It's not bigger than the fourth rib. There is a interstitial pattern right here, a pleural fissure line here, some indication of pleural effusion. There's retraction of the lung lobes right here. And on the left lateral, you can appreciate a very generalized bronchial pattern. So we've got an interstitial pattern and a bronchial pattern. The radiologist writes, the cardiac silhouette is accentuated by pericardial fat, but is otherwise normal radiographically. And that's awesome. I don't see the pericardial fat, but I don't have their goggles. So, um, but I do agree that, that it does look normal radiographically. So there's no cardiomegaly. And then the right middle lung lobe is mostly collapsed with an alveolar pattern and a moderate right mediastinal shift. So everything is shifted over to the right. And that is a really common finding in feline lower airway disease because the right middle lung lobe is the most dependent bronchus. And so all of those respiratory secretions and mucus will pull into the right middle lung lobe and can cause consolidation of that. So I, I agree with the radiologist and there's evidence of chronic lower airway disease between the bronchial pattern and this consolidated right middle lung lobe. But looking at other parts of the chest, there is a interstitial pattern again over here in the caudal lung lobes. And the vessels, this one looks normal. Um, this artery does look bigger than the ninth rib where it crosses it. So there's potentially some, some pulmonary artery dilation. So, oh cats, <laughs> why do you have to be so complicated? So use all of your information, um, the history, the physical exam, the RADS, and if you want more diagnostics, get more diagnostics. So in our case, we wanted more information 
Um, so we got an ECG, which showed the presence of VPCs, which is suggestive that there is a cardiac component going on here, and a SNAP pro BNP. So the SNAP pro BNP comes back as normal or abnormal. And in Ralph's case, it came back abnormal. So that means that the sample dot right here was darker than the reference spot. And that tells us that his pro BNP is greater than 200, which tells us there is increased stretch and stress on the myocardium, and he is likely in congestive heart failure. If the two dots are equal in intensity, that is still an abnormal finding, but it tells us that the pro BNP is kind of in this gray zone at 150 to 200. And if the reference spot is darker, that is a normal result and says that congestive heart failure is not likely and corresponds to a BNP of less than 150. We did send out a BNP for Ralph and it came back at 787, so that was quite high. So poll question number two. Here. Okay, can they see that now? It's launched. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Poll question number two. Which would be the best course of treatment for Ralph the cat? And go ahead and, and select the answer that you um, think the most is, is accurate. So one, let's cover our bases and treat everything. So let's give furosemide for the suspected heart failure and corticosteroids for the lower airway disease that we also think is there. Uh, choice two, let's only treat for suspected congestive heart failure first and see how Ralph responds. And then choice three, let's only treat for feline lower airway disease first and see how Ralph responds. After all, he's been coughing chronically. So give you a few seconds. See a few more answers coming in. Okay, I think everyone has submitted. So I'm gonna end the poll. Okay, so share the results, thank you. Okay, so 7% of you want to treat with furosemide and corticosteroids. So we're gonna treat everything. 79% want to only treat the congestive heart failure first. And 14% want to treat the lower airway disease first, which we, you know, we're pretty convinced he has feline asthma. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. And then how do I get out of this? Just drag it over here. Or just over it. Okay, cool. All right, so let's see what happens. Okay, so our diagnosis was suspected congestive heart failure and feline chronic lower airway disease. My diagnosis is I think he's actually clinical for the congestive heart failure right now. So he had been, you know, not stable, but he had been well compensated with his respiratory disease with just mild coughing for a long time. Um, but now something has changed and he's really, really dyspneic. And I see an interstitial pattern on his radiographs. In addition, he has VPCs on his physical exam and his ECG and he has an abnormal pro BNP SNAP result. So I know that there's something bad going on with the heart. So in this case, if I, if I treat just the heart failure and I was wrong and all this was asthma, then I've made him a little bit dehydrated. And that sucks, but I'm a, you know, we can fix that. Like we can get past that. But if I said, okay, he just has asthma and that's what's going on right now and I'm gonna give you steroids, and I'm wrong, and it ends up being congestive heart failure, now I've caused a really pronounced intravascular water expansion, and I've increased the preload to his heart, and I'm gonna worsen his congestive heart failure. And he might not survive that. So I would rather err on the side of treating the heart disease, and then if that isn't going well after a day or two, then I can always regroup, and I can start treating the airway disease. So for him, I did butorphanol to help sedate him. He was pretty anxious oxygen therapy, and I gave him a two mg per kick. So I picked the middle of the dose range for cats, a two mg per kick bolus of furosemide IM. Then we backed off to one mg per kick furosemide IV every one to two hours, every four hours, and then every six hours. I did not give him any corticosteroids because I didn't want to worsen the suspected congestive heart failure. And I thought in the back of my head, if he's not improving, I could at least give him a puff of albuterol 
Um, so albuterol is going to just go right locally to the lungs and that's going to be okay for the heart. So I could always do that if I needed to. However, I didn't need to. Ralph significantly improved after 12 hours of congestive heart failure therapy. So, yay! So his resting respiratory rate went from 100 all the way down to 42 breaths per minute. So now at this point, he can go home and become an outpatient. So my to-go home dose for furosemide in cats is not shockingly half the dose of dogs. So we're gonna target one mg per kg twice a day. In Ralph, we gave him half of a 12.5 milligram tablet. Um, little trick for your owners, when you cut these tablets in half, they pulverize, they will shatter. So the best thing to do is to take your fingers and gently press on either side of the score of the pill, and it, it comes apart much more nicely that way. So half of a tablet twice a day for long-term use. And that was close to our target dose of one mg per kg. Um, if Ralph was eating, which I don't think he was at this point, but once he's eating, we can do clopidogrel, 75 milligram tablets, a quarter of a tablet per cat once a day inside of a capsule. Clopidogrel can cause anorexia um, and vomiting, so I like them to be eating first before I, I prescribe it. And clopidogrel is probably the most bitter tasting substance in the history of the world to the cat. If you give it to them as a naked tablet, a quarter tablet, they will foam at the mouth, they will spit all over the owner's wall, and then the owner probably will never be able to medicate them again. And I sound like I'm talking in hyperbole, but I'm not. Like it's really, really bitter. So we do prefer to put it inside of a empty gel capsule. A size number four or number five works great. Owners can get this off of Amazon. They can get it from a pharmacy. Um, I just really feel like that works better. Pimobendin, I don't recommend it without an echo as a first line of treatment in the cat. So we, we did not prescribe that for Ralph as he had not had an echo. And discharge instructions and follow-up is the same for dogs. An optional medication several weeks down the line, you can add on benazapril if the cat is eating, because again, the side effects, right? So 0.25 to 0.5 mg per kg once a day. And in Ralph, if we were gonna give this to him, um, we would do half of a five mg tablet once a day, which is 0.49 mg per kg. And I would definitely wanna make sure that he was tolerating his clopidogrel well first, because um, that's the more important of the two to prevent thromboembolism. Okay, so thank you guys for hanging in there. This went a little bit over time. I'm sorry about that, but there's just so much I had to tell you. Um, so now would be a good time for questions, and it looks like there's three so far, and, and feel free to submit more if you have any. Okay, so what grade murmur in a puppy do you think is reasonable to monitor for resolution as an innocent murmur? Okay, that's a great question. I, I definitely get that question a lot, and it's a good one. So in a puppy, a puppy can have a completely innocent murmur that is supposed to disappear by about 16 weeks of age. Not always, but most of them go away by 16 weeks of age. A typical innocent puppy murmur will be a grade one or a grade two out of six. And location is very important. So the three places we list, listen for a murmur, well, I guess there's really four, in a puppy would be the left base, the left apex, and the right thorax. And then the fourth location in the puppy is way, way up in the axillary area because that's where we're gonna hear a PDA. So a puppy murmur is going to be a grade one to two at the left base. So right at the you know, third or fourth intercostal space. And it's not going to radiate. So if you hear it on two sides of the chest, it's probably not innocent. Um, if you hear it over the apex or way up in the armpit, it's probably not innocent. But if it's a grade one or two, it's systolic and it's at the left base, you can feel comfortable about waiting um, and seeing if that one goes away. And if it doesn't go away by 16 weeks, then I would recommend an echo. There's still a possibility it could be a benign murmur, but a little bit less likely now, so an echo would be recommended. Okay, just keep going. Yeah. Okay. Can you describe what you hear to detect extrasystoles with a heart rate of 220? Sure. So a premature beat, your ear might not pick up on it at 220 beats per minute. So you might not hear the little extra from the extra systole. But anytime there's a VPC, the heart rhythm has what's called a compensatory pause as it resets itself. 
And so your ear is much, much better at picking up on the pause. So if I'm gonna, I can, I can try, I, over my career, I've learned to imitate murmurs and heart sounds and everything. So I'm probably gonna make a fool of myself, but if I try to imitate it, you would hear the pause. So it sounds like, and so that little pause is, is how your ears would pick up on something. So hopefully that was uh, helpful. And then how do you give Ralph a puff of albuterol? Okay, good question. So I recommend having an AeroCat device. Um, AeroCat is spelled funny. It's A-E-R-O and then capital K-K-A-T. So AeroCat. And it's just that uh, face mask and spacer that we put onto the cat whenever we're giving them an inhaled medication. So you put the face mask over the cat, attach the spacer, and then attached to that is the albuterol. So you actuate or depress the albuterol and then keep the mask over the cat's face for about six to eight breaths because it takes that long for the cat to pull all of it from the spacer into their mask and into their lungs. Um, so we do keep an arrow cat in our ER um, for, that, for that very purpose. Okay, and it looks like there's another question. Okay. Um, can you explain why you would add on spironolactone in the case of Heidi when she seemed to be doing well on furosemide? Okay, so we add it on not for its diuretic effects because you're right, she's doing well. We add it on for its aldosterone antagonistic effects. So we're trying to prevent long-term myocardial fibrosis. We're trying to pr preserve the function of the ventricular myocytes and keep them beating. Um, so we don't want there to be scar tissue formation in the heart. Um, there was a good study that was done, I think it was published in 2010, that showed that dogs with valve disease that are in heart failure um, did better and had less hospitalizations when they received spironolactone compared to dogs that did not receive spironolactone. So their heart disease was managed a little bit better when we added that medication in. Okay. Do you use an ACE inhibitor to reduce a cough from left atrial enlargement, but no congestive heart failure? Um, so no, I don't. I, I don't think that ACE inhibitors reduce cough from left atrial enlargement. Um, they don't significantly decrease the heart size. So um, one of the mechanisms of coughing in that situation is a really dilated left atrium that is compressing on the left main stem bronchus. So ACE inhibitors are not gonna decrease left atrial size. So we're not gonna see um, or expect to see any improvement with the cough. That being said, now that I am using pemobendin for stage B2 dogs, so these dogs that have left atrial enlargement but aren't in failure yet, um, as an unintended effect, which has been great, I have seen some dogs on pemobendin either decrease cough or, or stop their coughing completely when we put them on pemobendin because pemobendin does alter the hemodynamics of the heart and the cardiovascular system enough that sometimes we absolutely do shrinking down. We see shrinking down of the left atrium. So um, I think pemobendin, I mean, I certainly wouldn't prescribe it just to reduce a cough, that, that wouldn't make sense to me. But a benefit of if the dog does need it for stage B2 severe heart enlargement is that we might see a reduction in the cough. Okay. Um, Aspirin versus clopidogrel, great question. Um, so I'd refer you to what we call the FAT CAT study, another one of those awesome acronyms. Um, it stands for feline arterial thromboembolism clopidogrel versus aspirin trial, so FAT CAT. Um, and what it showed is that cats who had survived a thromboembolic event were then either put on aspirin or clopidogrel in a blinded manner. And the cats that were put on clopidogrel had a median survival time of almost one year. I think it was 354 days. Um, if I'm right, someone has to get me a lollipop. But um, I think it was about 354 days. And aspirin was only about two months survival. Um, so there is a survival benefit of using clopidogrel over aspirin, which is why I have now switched to it. Um, stay tuned though, because there's another study that someone at the University of Georgia is recruiting cats for right now. They have about half of their enrollment completed. This study is called the Super Cat Study, and now they're, 
<laughs> Heidi's laughing next to me. She's like, what is this acronym? Um, so the Supercat study is comparing clopidogrel to rivaroxaban, so a, a, a 10A antagonist, to see if one of those is better than the other. Um, but right now, the standard of care would be clopidogrel at 18.75 mg once a day. Okay, and then the last one was um, someone just saying thank you. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Sell. Um, I appreciate that you came. And I appreciate that all of you came. Um, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So thanks so much for spending your Wednesday afternoon with me. Hopefully you learned something and I'll talk to you guys soon.